it's a lot. I have my house right here, so either I have to choose, you know. So it's pretty hard right now for us. Their house may be damaged. The only thing you can do is get your car and get out. This is historic flooding that goes all the way back till somebody started keeping a record. The moment Washington residents woke up that morning, something was already terribly wrong. Water was where it shouldn't be. Streets that had been dry for decades were turning into rivers. And the worst part? The strongest warnings hadn't even been issued yet. What unfolded across Washington state wasn't just another winter storm, it was a catastrophic demonstration of how quickly our modern world can collapse when nature decides to break the rules we thought we understood. By the time officials scrambled to issue evacuation orders, entire neighborhoods were already underwater. Major rivers burst through their banks faster than anyone anticipated. Transportation corridors that connect millions of people simply vanished beneath surging floodwaters. This wasn't supposed to happen. Not like this, not this fast. The culprit behind this disaster wasn't a single massive storm. Instead, Washington faced something far more dangerous, a relentless barrage of atmospheric river events that stacked on top of each other like a house of cards ready to collapse. These narrow bands of concentrated Pacific moisture slammed into the state one after another, each delivering hours of torrential rainfall before the land could even begin to recover from the previous assault. Think of atmospheric rivers as invisible highways of water vapor stretching thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean. When they make landfall, they dump extraordinary amounts of rain in concentrated areas. But what made this event so devastating was the timing. Multiple atmospheric rivers arrived in rapid succession, overwhelming every natural and man-made defense system Washington had. The Snoqualmie, Skagit, Chehalis, Stillaguamish, and Yakima rivers all surged past flood stage simultaneously. Water gauges recorded levels not seen in over a decade, but numbers on a chart don't capture the human reality of what was happening on the ground. In Snohomish County, the town of Sultan became a haunting example of nature's raw power. Areas that had stayed dry for generations suddenly found themselves beneath feet of churning water. Emergency crews launched desperate boat evacuations, navigating through what used to be suburban streets to rescue families trapped in their flooding homes. More than 200 properties suffered damage, many with water reaching well into living spaces, destroying everything families had worked years to build. The agricultural heartland of the Skagit Valley faced its own nightmare. Thousands of acres of productive farmland disappeared beneath muddy floodwaters. Dairy farmers raced against time, moving cattle to higher ground as water levels rose by the hour. But the immediate danger was only part of the crisis. Contaminated flood runoff would poison the soil for months, threatening not just this season's income, but the very survival of family farms passed down through generations. Down in Lewis County, frustration mixed with fear as the Chehalis River overflowed yet again. For residents here, severe flooding has become an almost annual trauma despite years of studies and promised solutions. The psychological toll was evident. Families forced to evacuate knew this wouldn't be the last time they'd flee their homes. But here's where the story takes an even more troubling turn. The flooding wasn't just overwhelming rivers and farms. It was systematically dismantling the infrastructure that keeps modern society functioning. Interstate 5 the West Coast's most critical transportation artery, ground to a halt near Chehalis. Even brief closures on this vital corridor sent shockwaves through supply chains, delaying deliveries of food, fuel, and essential goods to communities hundreds of miles away. Authorities say a person has died after apparently driving into the floodwaters. And emergency crews are urging everybody to be ready to go at a moment's notice because we're expecting more heavy rainfall through the morning. The Snohomish River in Snohomish is going over the levee just to the north of Harvey Field. At least one person has been killed due to drowning. The ripple effects were immediate and far-reaching. State Route 2, a crucial east-west connection, vanished beneath a massive landslide near Monroe. Both lanes were completely buried, cutting off access between western Washington and the Cascade foothills. Emergency responders found themselves unable to reach communities that desperately needed help. The rail network fared no better. 
BNSF Railway reported multiple track washouts that brought freight movement to a standstill. Amtrak suspended passenger service between Seattle and Vancouver, stranding travelers and highlighting how vulnerable our transportation systems truly are. Urban areas discovered their own vulnerabilities. Storm drains in King and Pierce counties, designed for typical winter rainfall, were overwhelmed within hours. Streets nowhere near major rivers turned into torrents. Aging levees along the Snoqualmie and Skagit rivers required emergency reinforcement as water pressed against defenses that were never built for this level of assault. What officials described as cascading infrastructure failure revealed an uncomfortable truth. When multiple systems fail simultaneously, recovery becomes exponentially more difficult. Each failure compounds the others, creating a spiral of dysfunction that modern communities are poorly equipped to handle. As the scale of the disaster became clear, Washington's emergency response network kicked into overdrive. The National Guard mobilized for high-water rescues and sandbagging operations. Local fire departments, sheriff's offices, and volunteer rescue teams worked around the clock, often in dangerous conditions with poor visibility and unstable currents. The rescue operations were harrowing. Crews navigated submerged streets filled with hidden debris, racing to reach residents before escape routes vanished completely. Every minute counted. Delays meant the difference between successful evacuations and potentially tragic outcomes. Emergency shelters opened across affected counties, but keeping them operational proved challenging as power outages and transportation disruptions complicated relief efforts. Despite these obstacles, the coordinated response prevented any reported fatalities, though several people suffered injuries from flood-related vehicle crashes and encounters with debris. While western Washington battled unprecedented flooding, an unexpected crisis emerged east of the Cascades. Benton County and parts of central Washington, regions typically associated with dry winters, were blindsided by an intense surge of rainfall that defied historical patterns. A stalled Pacific storm system had done something unusual. It funneled moisture deep into the Columbia Basin, delivering more than a month's worth of rain in less than 48 hours. Areas designed for arid conditions suddenly faced flooding they were never built to handle. The Yakima River rose sharply, triggering flood warnings in communities that rarely worry about too much water. Smaller waterways like Ammon Creek and Zintel Canyon Creek exceeded capacity, spilling into residential areas. In Kennewick, Richland, and Prosser, storm drains failed catastrophically, turning intersections into shallow but dangerous rivers. For residents of eastern Washington, this flooding delivered a sobering message. Nowhere is safe from extreme weather anymore. Communities that had never planned for significant flooding found themselves scrambling to respond to a threat they'd never seriously considered. As floodwaters began their slow retreat, Washington faced the harsh reality of recovery. Initial damage estimates suggested tens of millions of dollars in losses, but the true cost would extend far beyond immediate repairs. The entire town of Burlington and Skagit County and Sumas near the Canadian border have been forced to flee the dangerous flood water. This has been a major flood and everybody around here has been scared to death. This is one of the first known deaths in the region connected to the record flooding that began last week. One street over, it's completely clear all the way up, and this street's completely sunk still. Washington Governor Bob Ferguson announcing a statewide emergency declaration in response to extreme flooding. Agricultural regions faced particularly grim prospects. Saturated fields would remain unusable for months. Contaminated soil would require extensive remediation before crops could grow again. Dairy and livestock operations reported damage to essential infrastructure that insurance might not fully cover. Small businesses across flooded communities faced an uncertain future. Water damage, power outages, and transportation disruptions forced closures that many couldn't afford. Business owners discovered too late that their flood insurance, if they had any, often provided limited coverage. The broader economic impacts rippled outward. Freight delays on Interstate 5 and disrupted rail service threatened regional supply chains. State agencies began coordinating with federal partners to assess damage and potentially unlock disaster assistance. But the bureaucratic process would take time communities didn't have. Infrastructure assessments revealed widespread stress on bridges, culverts, and levees. Many showed signs of damage that would require extensive repairs or complete replacement. 
the price tag for bringing systems back to pre-flood conditions was staggering, and that assumed no more extreme weather events in the near future, an increasingly risky assumption. Climate experts delivered a stark warning. What Washington experienced wasn't an anomaly, but a preview. Warming temperatures are intensifying atmospheric rivers, increasing both their frequency and the amount of moisture they carry. Infrastructure designed for historical weather patterns is increasingly inadequate for the new reality. The flooding that devastated Washington state serves as a wake-up call for communities everywhere. When multiple atmospheric rivers strike in succession, when infrastructure fails in Cascade, when regions that rarely flood suddenly find themselves underwater, these aren't isolated incidents, but symptoms of a changing world. Washington's experience demonstrates how quickly modern society's carefully constructed systems can unravel when nature exceeds our expectations. The state's residents showed remarkable resilience, emergency responders performed heroically, and communities came together in crisis. But heroism and resilience can only do so much when the fundamental assumptions about weather and infrastructure no longer hold true. As cleanup efforts continue and communities begin the long process of rebuilding, one question looms large. If this is what happens when several atmospheric rivers strike in sequence, what happens when the storms grow even stronger? Washington State just provided a preview, and it's a preview that should concern us all. The water has receded, but the lessons remain. In an era of intensifying weather extremes, no community is truly safe, no infrastructure is truly adequate, and no assumption about normal weather can be trusted. Washington State learned this the hard way. The question now is whether the rest of us will learn from their experience or wait for our own floods to arrive. That's it for today, folks. See you in the next video.